lots of history here. We're going to get some pictures of what the old uh, tent was like. Now, in this chapter, Apollos reviews the old picture. He, review, he reviews that shadowy picture where the glorious ark was overshadowed by a, a pair of golden cherubim. Uh, overshadowed by a couple of angels on the cover of that box, on the atonement cover. Right. A couple of youthful angels, yep, with a wingspan the full width of the ark, which is about, it's about two foot wingspan. A cherubim at each end of that uh, gold slab of atonement cover, facing each other and staring down at the center of the box. That's staring at that mysterious something called the mercy seat that we're going to read about in Exodus 25. Then later on, those cherubim were overshadowed by much larger cherubim, a pair of enormous golden cherubim now with a wingspan, the full width of the Holy of Holies, each with a wingspan of about 15 feet. You can read in 2 Chronicles. No doubt, staring at the mysterious mystery mysterious mercy seat as well. Then Apollos tells you to hang up this new picture instead, since the old picture was just a shadow. It was just a character of a much made much larger by that Solomon character. Whereas the new picture is a high resolution picture, a high res picture of your now resurrected Messiah. So hang up this new picture of an angel at both ends of the stone slab where Jesus had been laid in John 20 with one of those live angels being granted the great honor of saying, he is not here, he is risen. We're going to read that in Matthew and Mark. Welcome to the new age, yeah, as some dragons say. Welcome to the new mercy seat. And back to our present chapter. In our ver first verse of this chapter, Calvin suspected something was seriously wrong in this first verse of chapter 9. His very popular majority manuscripts which is what the King James was based on, spoke about a, a tabernacle rather than about a covenant, which skews the topic a bit, as if a physical tabernacle were all that important. Those majority manuscripts spoke about, spoke about something physical rather than something about something metaphysical. However, our recently discovered minority manuscripts prove Calvin's suspicions to be perfectly correct. Apollos was still speaking about the metaphysical covenant here, about God's verbal commitment to man, speaking of a more perfect tabernacle, a tabernacle of covenant law to administer perfect justice to man, as we read in Revelations 15, and administering that only Jesus can do. And then Apollos begins to referring to numerous old picture items in the first room of that now non-existent tent or tabernacle, old picture items that were later placed in Solomon's enormous reno of that tent. A renovation called the first temple. Old picture items that were ransacked and destroyed by the Babylonians in the 6th century BC, just as Jeremiah had foretold. Apollos was referring to those old picture items that were presently missing from the second temple, a very sparse rebuild by Nehemiah that was just about to be destroyed by Rome at this point. Missing items such as a golden lampstand that was fueled with pure olive oil to continuously illuminate the first room of that tent. Missing items such as a gorgeous golden table that was stocked with 12 fresh loaves of bread for the priests to consume every Sabbath. Bread representing an everlasting covenant for the sons of tribes of Israel. Bread presented on pure gold plates, along with pure gold bowls and pitchers and cups for washing that covenantal bread down, with a little frankincense added for ambience, for smell good, to overpower the smell of ceremonial blood in the holy tent, and to oversmell the smell of, well, burning flesh and burning hair, which is not too appetizing. Apollos then finish with, finishes with the more heavenly missing items of cherubim and an atonement cover. Items missing from the inner room of that tent. 
And he will consume, continue speaking to those having the items, but just not right now. Not before he uh, just dismisses those earthly gifts and sacrifices being made outside of the tent as being wholly inadequate. Those bulls and goats. <laughs> wholly inadequate for a proper inward cleansing. Apollos then goes into great detail. Detail of the great atonement. This new atonement requiring blood, just as the old atonement demanded blood. A bloody term, which we are about to see a lot. With the added detail of this new atonement making us inwardly clean. This new atonement cleaning our consciences, as we are told in verses 9 and 14. Whereas the old atonement only made those old folks outwardly clean. Only outwardly tolerable. Not necessarily forgiven, as we see in verse 22 of our NIV. More of a liberation or more of a purging than an outright forgiveness, according to commentators A and Johnson. A peculiar purging that we will see mentioned again in our next chapter. Although Apollos is probably just generalizing here that old atonement might also have cleansed their conscience for a few fleeting moments. Might have deceivingly purged their conscience as if, if they had some misguided faith in the atonement of some bread or some brute beasts and bulls or goats. Still, it would only have cleansed their conscience till their very next sin, right? It would have been just as temporal as doing confession to a priest, like Hail Mary today and Hail tomorrow. Yet, in those days, their guilt would typically linger till the following day of atonement, which could be quite a while away. Like Christmas, the atonement is only once a year, as Apollos emphasizes very strongly in verse 7. There is no Christmas in July. With the delightful point being that this new and improved atonement brings with it an immediately renewed spirit. Brings with someone who immediately comes alongside us so that we might serve the living God with a refreshed spirit. Verse 14. This new atonement brings with it the Holy Spirit of the living God. Way, way better than Christmas. However, the reference here speaks to the eternal spirit of Christ. Not to the Holy Spirit referenced in verse 8. The text of verse 14 demands that distinction. And you'll see in this graphic here, where that is um, pointed out very ably by in our manuscript. And you'll see the reasons why in the text you can read that. So, in a word, Apollos was pretty insistent that this glory be given to Christ, not to the Holy Spirit. Then we have that confusing word covenant again, but this time presumably having the, the semantic range possibly meaning last will or testament as we see in our NIV. Although our commentators dispute that translation of last will, with our commentators saying it actually means, still means covenant. Now, this will is an effect that takes... Is, uh, oh, we'll skip that part. So... We go into this next part that says, this is a death that is not repeated repeatedly, endlessly repeated, as we kept hearing today, repeated endlessly, as in the Catholic Mass, since that would trivialize his once and for all sacrifice. Nor was Jesus reincarnated, as some Hindus suggested, nor transmigrated into a cow or a loon, or a different, which is a different kind of blood altogether. And just a small transfusion of that kind of blood will prove that to you very quickly. It will prove that you are indeed. No, he was resurrected to an eternal life with an eternal spirit, resurrected since he was empowered by the eternal spirit. And so shall you be resurrected to eternal life if you believe in him and his eternal blood, not the blood of bulls and goats. Um, <clears throat> now, We'll skip some more here, and I'll talk about Schreiner having said that uh, that some, well, we'll get on to uh, Calvin, I, I guess, a bit. Calvin says that all sin can be attributed to ignorance, and that men never deliberately rush into ruin, but being entangled in the deceptions of Satan, they lose the power of judging rightly. But I... I dispute that. And so does Schreiner here by saying that some men are just plain defiant that 
and and that was recognized in the Old Testament too. Uh, and Lane says that too that defiant sins were not amenable to forgiveness in the Old Testament either. There were defiant sins like blaspheming the Lord or blaspheming the Holy Spirit at this point in time as well. And uh, Schreiner said lots of passages to prove his point. And Apollos was not ignorant that some sins were plain outright defiant and not just some mistakes, some uh, deception. Anyways, on with this, we see that Philo, we, we made reference to Philo earlier too, who is a contemporary of Apollos. He was not ignorant of the altar of, there's some dispute about where these, uh, where these items actually were. Uh, some people, because here we have it saying that the altar of incense was in, in, the, in the first room. And, uh, and whereas Apollos said originally the, the altar of incense was outside of the first room. And Apollos was not ignorant of that either. Neither was Philo, who was a contemporary of his. Just like that covenantal bread was not originally on the golden table either. It was in a basket just inside the first room. So Apollos was not spatially challenged by this idea of it being on inside the first uh, chamber, the first curtain. That altar was indeed in front of the front of the ark, originally just on the other side of the curtain, offering a pleasing aroma to the testimony of the ark, or that box. And everybody knew that. But at some point in time, that altar of incense got moved inside the Holy of Holies, along with a couple of enormous golden cherubim that I mentioned earlier. It got moved in when the tent saw a major reno by Solomon, when serious doors were installed to separate those inner and outer rooms when incense could not permeate those gold-covered doors. So it got moved inside. Now, as far as the ark containing, that box containing the manna and the staff, as Apollo suggests here, well, that's a little more problematic. It is. It is certainly possible that they may have been placed in the ark of the covenant a little later on, uh, according to Josiah, perhaps. You know, they have placed in the ark with the later renovation by Josiah. Uh, according to our commentator William L. Lane, and he's referring to some rabbinic evidence by the rabbis, some evidence of that, that stuff actually got placed in that box. That, that manna, that sticky manna got placed in that box. But as I understand it, those rabbinic sources were several centuries after Apollos. And that was, uh, for the most part, in the ba something called the Babylonian Talmud, which was written between the third, was sometime between the third and the sixth century AD after Apollos. And that's a source that actually even suggests that some of the broken tablets, you all remember those broken tablets of the Ten Commandments, it suggests that those broken tablets were inside that box as well, along with a scroll of the complete law. Well, not exactly, because the complete law would certainly not fit in that box. That would be a scroll way too big for that box. So that would be a mighty crowded Talmud, a mighty crowded box, even by the Talmud's own accounting. Too crowded for a bowl of manna and a staff to be put in there as well. And uh, it would be kind of silly to be putting that stuff in there because it's hardly as holy as the scrolls or those tablets. So I suspect there's some missing piece of the puzzle here, just as Calvin suspected something missing a little bit earlier on, some missing portion of the manuscript, perhaps. Uh, and I'm not talking about um, missing in our manuscripts either. I'm thinking missing in the very, very original, not in the earliest manuscripts, but I'm thinking there's something missing even earlier. And, uh, or it's also possible that that N word being put 
in the ark was put in there accidentally by the scribe as you see in this manuscript I have outlined in, in here. It's possible that N word got stuck in there accidentally when the scribe wrote this manuscript because sometimes your eyes skip from one N to the other or as, as I underlined here, skip from one golden to the other golden from one golden um, item to another or from one holy to another your eyes go just sort of wander and, and you stick and accidentally stick an in in there it's not it's irrelevant it's not important anyway and it also looked that in there actually looks pretty deliberate if you see what I I've, I've highlighted there you can still see that yellow the golden highlight there I guess uh, where that in part is see that the golden highlights in that graphic there and, it, and that second in there looks pretty deliberate so I'm I'm guessing that in was actually in the arc so either way Apollos is generally correct regarding the manna and staff being in the general vicinity so we got to be gracious to Apollos and allow some room for symbolism and it really doesn't matter anyway and then our final verse of this chapter directs us to some bothersome hanging once again as Pooh would say oh bother since it directs us to a certain waiting once again waiting for a certain salvation once again right uh, nothing like waiting for a hind paw eh? it directs us to a certain salvation that will come to those that wait for him Salvation to those that embrace the new picture of a mercy seat until their final days. So hang in there and hang that picture up and then prepare to be embraced. Yay.